Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. Today we are breaking down my Sisei Legend Chain deck. This is a five color Sisei deck basically that is meant to have your Sisei in the command zone and use a series of tutors with Sisei's ability to win the game. This deck was one that I took to the top 16 of one of the most recent Mox Masters as well as one that I've been playing a lot lately and I wanted to break this deck down specifically because it's kind of a complicated deck and if you don't really know the deck, the lines and the play patterns can be kind of confusing and also specifically because I think this deck is really, really solid. I went to the Bearded Dragon event this weekend, co-run by the Scry Babies, and they had these on-demand uh, CEDH pods for, you know, no proxy CEDH on-demand pods where people would just come and play their decks. And every one of the paid events I entered, I won with this deck and several of the casual pods I played with this deck over the weekend, I also was able to to take the win with. I even lent the deck out and uh, one of the pilots who was using it just absolutely dominated the game with this deck. So it's been performing super, super well for me. I think it's one of the decks I'm feeling most comfortable with in a competitive pod and it's super hard for your opponents to dissect what you're going to be doing because half the time the deck can be so complicated with exactly what the correct pattern is that you don't even know what you're doing. So it's a little complicated, but it's also extremely fun. As I mentioned, whenever I'm doing top breakdowns with Sisse in them, I always can mention how flexible these lists can be. I definitely have cards that I feel are like the most optimal for my list where it is right now and even I have changes that I think might help to optimize the list for that just little bit extra speed and consistency. But there's so much flexibility for this archetype. So many different ways you can build it, so many different niche pieces that you know you can add into it and I'm really excited to break it down. Before we do so, make sure to hit that like button and that subscribe button. It helps out the channel a ton and while you're here, think about considering supporting us over at patreon.com slash comedian mtg you can get benefits like having your name in the credits of this video you can have a one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with me through patreon although that can be done outside of the patreon as well and a number of other benefits that you can find on that website let's break down this sisse legend chain list so we have five color sisse as our commander for this deck sisse is a two two for three two and one white legendary creature human soldier and it gets plus one plus one for each color among other legendary permanents you control and you can pay one of each color wooberg to search your library for a legendary permanent card with mana value less than sisse's power and put that card onto the battlefield then shuffle okay so the idea is you can increase sisse's power by having more legendary permanents on the battlefield and as you're increasing her power you can start pulling bigger and bigger things out of your deck and the hope is that with certain pieces you can just start chaining the activations of sisse until you get a win in ways that genuinely can surprise your opponents a lot and also once again it's a deck that has a lot of layering to it so it's not just like a simple a plus b combo it's the potential to to turn one card into another card into another card that is the most flexible given the current situation that you're in. And there's a lot of cards with a lot of utility in this deck and we can go through them now. I think the most important thing to start with is the Planeswalkers. Now, we can skip right past the battle because we have Invasion of Ikoria here, which is an all-star in the deck for sure, but most of the time it's just two mana, go get your Dockside. Although I did play in a game where Sisse was completely locked out because there was a Curse Totem on the battlefield, and uh, I did flip my Invasion and start whacking in for eight damage with this uh, Zlortha, as well as like Sisse, which had like six power at the time. So that actually can be a win condition in certain circumstances. But I think the Planeswalkers are the most important thing to understand about this list. And let's start with one of the basic combos in the deck, and that involves Amanatu the Fate Shifter and Nicol Bolas Dragon God. Now, these two aren't explicitly a combo by themselves, but what they do is create this ability for Amanatu's second ability, the most important ability on her, which is that you can exile another target permanent you own and then return it to the battlefield under your control. Then, Nicol Bolas has a static ability that says Nicol Bolas Dragon God has all loyalty abilities of all other planeswalkers on the battlefield. So with those two cards on the battlefield at the same time, what that basically does is create a situation where each of them can reset one another. So Amanatu is able to minus one to flicker Nicol Bolas, and Nicol Bolas is able to minus one to flicker Amanatu. And this way, they can reset their activations. So what we have here is a loop where you can basically flicker each of these planeswalkers infinitely at sorcery speed. But you need to pay off for that. And this is where Oath of Teferi comes in. Oath of 
of Teferi's an enchantment for five mana. It says when it enters the battlefield, you can exile another target permanent you control and then return to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. That is not really the relevant part of this card. <laughs> the most relevant part is you can activate loyalty abilities of planeswalkers you control twice each turn rather than once. This is where this stuff gets interesting, because what you can do is, a very basic level, you can flicker Aminatu with Nicol Bolas, and then you have a second minus one, and then you can flicker any other permanent. So you can flicker a land, and then suddenly you flicker your Nicol Bolas, and Nicol Bolas can minus one twice as well, so it can flicker Aminatu and then flicker a land. And that's a quick way to generate infinite mana, is by flickering those lands back and forth. There are also other permanents in the deck that either have Enter the Battlefield abilities or are themselves Planeswalkers. So for example, if you add a card like three mana Teferi in here, Teferi Time Raveler, you can then start bouncing things and drawing cards. And suddenly that is an outlet for you as well, because every time you do, you flicker it. Or if you have a card like Sahili Rai, Sahili Rai says scry one, it deals one damage to each opponent. So now you have a loop here where you are actually able to flicker the Sahili every time you go through the flickering Aminatu and Nicol Bolas loops and you're able to ping your opponents to death. Nicol Bolas can draw you into the rest of these combos if for some reason you don't have more mana to keep going through Sisei activations because Nicol Bolas says you draw a card as it's plus one and each opponent exiles a card from their hand or a permanent they control. So as you're going through this loop, you can actually strip all of the cards from your opponent's hands and exile all permanents they can Control, just for that extra layer of safety when you start getting your combo going. That's the main combo in the deck. Now the card quality of these cards often comes into question with this list, and I find this is the biggest debate in Sisei, is whether to actually include this combo. Now I would argue Aminatu is probably the most practical one of this group. I find that I'm able to flicker very important permanents quite often. Something as simple as flickering a Gaia's Cradle to reset the amount of mana it gives you, or flickering a Derevi to untap an important permanent, or, you know, crazy things like that yeah for example like flickering a derevi to untap a bloom tender that you have on the battlefield or once again hitting your dock side like crazy things like that are sort of why you play aminatu and that's why i feel like for three mana it actually provides you a decent amount of value nickel balls is not definitely at the level of card quality that you expect from a card in a cedh deck however the minus three ability is able to kill you know problematic creatures or planeswalkers which does actually come up in games like this one of the really interesting things about this deck is some of these pieces that have like you know traditional 60 card implications for their value things like oko and stuff like that start to become really relevant when you can pull them out of your deck and have them take effect at the right time one of the most recent additions and one of the strongest additions to come out very recently is Tyvar Jubilant Brawler, and this is one of the cards that actually made me interested in Five Color Sisse in the first place. The most important part about the card is its static ability, which says you can activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. So if you think about mana dorks and things like Bloom Tender and Faber Elder, which we'll start talk about in a little bit, these start to get very important because you're playing a five color deck that is full of permanents that have colored mana costs, and because of that, you're able to turn cards like Favor Elder and Bloom Tender into immediate mana sources when you have Tyvar out. Not only that, Tyvar can be pulled out with Sisse and then untap the thing you just used to activate Sisse in the first place. So Tyvar has a lot of strengths and often the minus two ability actually does become kind of relevant. You can, you know, minus two and get back your Dockside from your graveyard or your Bloom Tender or any of the cards that we just talked about. So it does actually put in a decent amount of work. Sahili Rai is an interesting one, and it makes a little bit more sense when you dive deep into the logistics of the deck, but basically it's in there because you need a card that can come in, and it's specifically because of its minus two. It says create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types, and it gains haste and exile at the next end step. So the reason this is relevant is specifically when you're comboing off with uh, either Bloom Tender, Faber Elder, or Dockside Extortionist, Sahili can come in, make a hasty copy of something, and importantly, as you're noticing from a lot of the pips up here, red is not a very common color in these Sisei lines. So it's actually kind of important that Sahili is blue and red because it starts to add more power to Sisei and it starts to create a clean way for you to get up to that five mana cost, which is sort of the pivotal mana cost for comboing off of this list. Dihana is actually one of my newer additions to the deck, but I am very, very happy with it and it actually cleaned up a decent amount of lines. Now, I know there are lines that people have talked about with the cards here that I have in the sideboard, Cultist of the Absolute and the 7 mana Chromatic Orrery, which should be in my sideboard, but maybe went to the Considering instead. 
So here we have our chromatic ori, and basically what that loop creates, and something I still want to test with this deck a little bit more, is you can go from Cult of the Absolute, and then you go into Dihada, and if you have one extra mana source, you can use activate Sisse again, which will go get your chromatic ori, and from that point, it becomes like kind of trivial to combo off with the deck. Ori is a card I just picked up. I think it might be good in the deck. I definitely had situations where I was playing this weekend where I thought, oh wait, Ori here would actually be pretty solid, but it also sort of relies on you playing Cult in the first place, which is not the biggest ask, but I feel like maybe that line's card quality diminishes the deck even further. And, you know, there's an argument that this could just be a clean replacement for the Nickel Bolas lines that I just talked about, but I tend to like those lines better because I find the ability for those Planeswalkers to actually have utility in the course of the game to be much more impactful and important. But yeah, a big part of Dihada, once again, like we talked about here, is the red pip. It's also the fact that, you know, if you don't have a Bloom Tender, if you don't have a favor elder if you don't have a dock side you can't really tutor things that start allowing you to pull multiple things out of your deck dihada sort of does that because you can use the minus three ability and it is something you have to be cautious of because if you go through these loops too many times with dihada and you start milling over your cards you actually needed to combo off it can get a little problematic because you know it basically stops you in your tracks but most of the time it shouldn't be doing that so dihada is able to come in mill you for four and create four treasures basically and the important part is that you do have four treasures because cards like Aminatu can flicker Dihada and then you can start doing some cute stuff with that combination of those cards which should eventually let you get to your Oath of Teferi lines. That after playing this weekend, as I mentioned, Dihada was pretty new this weekend. I do kind of want to look more into a legendary permanent that allows us to recur things. I know some people have traditionally played Luris, but I think the two mana value or less restrictions actually a real restriction. And I want to see if I can find basically something that will act like a legendary eternal witness, although I can't instinctively think of what that might be at the current moment. But I definitely want to tinker around with that idea. Also worth noting, Oko. Oko is actually really good in this deck. It's the ability to tutor and remove most problematic permanents because a lot of the problematic permanents that you're going to go up against in this deck are either creatures or artifacts. So you can just play Oko and turn them into an elk, which is really nice. One of the key utilities in this deck is that Oko gets in through Graft Digger's Cage and then can shut off Graft Digger's Cage so you can combo off with non Planeswalker things. If you need to combo off with a creature, Oko is kind of the card that allows you to pop off with that. But one of the biggest benefits of playing the list the way I have it is the fact that you can combo off through a Graft Digger's Cage pretty easily, actually. And it's definitely something to note because that really, really can speed up your clock and whatnot. Three Minute to Ferry is probably one of the like more controversial cards in CEDH just because in the decks that it's good in, it's really good in the decks that it's bad in, it's really bad. But because of Displacer Kitten, this card has been seeing a lot more play lately, and Sisse is one of the best places for this deck. The ability to, at someone's end step, activate Sisse, get to ferry onto the battlefield, and then go to your turn, knowing your opponents can't cast spells on your turn. Having that potential is a really solid guarantee, and it can really start to protect your wins. It's very, very good. We are interrupting myself in this deck tech to talk to you about Festival of Nights. This is a new CEDH event that I think is super exciting. We have Eminence Gaming, one of the two basically names in CEDH tournaments right now. They have a super awesome event that is going to be in Pennsylvania, only a couple hours away from where I am currently resided. It's August 26th and August 27th. This is going to be an event just like Punt City, just like Silicon Dynasty, just like all of the Eminence events you've come to know and love. Eminence, the co-runners of Mox Masters with Playing With Power, Eminence, you know, one of the premier names in CEDH tournaments, is throwing another one of these tournaments, Festival of Nights, in Pennsylvania, August 26th and the 27th. You know for a fact I will be there. And at the time you are watching this video, the tickets will be going live in one hour from the this video's release. So if you're watching this video on July 7th, 2023, the tickets are going out today at noon. And if you're watching it after July 7th, 2023, you should go check the Eminence website. I will leave a link in the description down below so you can jump right onto that. But this is a huge thing. It is a CDH tournament that kind of just popped out of nowhere. It's awesome. It's going to be solid. Eminence has yet to disappoint me with a live CEDH tournament. And y'all need to get in here and come play some CEDH. It's going to be an awesome time. I expect to see people there. Come check it out. Also worth noting, there are the classic room blocks that you can see right here. Uh, Eminence does a collaboration with whatever space they're working with to get you guys more affordable staying situations. So a place where you can actually 
crash for the night uh, after you compete your hardest at these tournaments. So it's something really awesome, and it helps to cut down the cost to traveling to these tournaments. It's going to be really awesome. As I mentioned, go get the tickets now. As I mentioned, there's been some cards that we've talked about a lot in this deck tech so far, and I want to cover those. Toxide Extortionist, Fabro Elder, and Bloom Tender are some of the most important creatures in this deck that are not legendary permanents. The most important part about these cards is they have the ability to enter the battlefield or be tapped for what is basically a Sisse activation in full. And that's where we start to get to the good stuff of this deck. So getting your Bloom Tender to a place where it can tap for five mana and or getting your Fabro Elder to do the same is super important for this list it's these mana dorks that are genuinely really really good for the deck and like just do what you want to be doing in the first place then have the ability to basically become combo engines is really really solid i mean it, it gets your game plan online in the first place and then it starts to turn to the win condition another card that fits into this vein is Silvala heart of the wilds if you can get sisse up to six power then every time you untap Silvala, it is a sisse activation because you need one green to activate Silvala, and then hopefully it will make you a wooberg amount of mana and then every time you get something to untap it, the idea is that you are hopefully untapping Svala with one green still floating, hence the six mana necessity. And uh, you can just keep going through that loop. And hopefully Svala will also allow you to go through your lines, which is really nice because the Fabro Elder and the Bloom Tender, like I mentioned, are not legendary permanents and Zavala is. So it's really nice to have the ability to start comboing off in your deck by just end step grabbing a Svala, putting it onto the battlefield. It can really, really clean up what you're trying to do with the deck and is one of the the cleanest ways to win. There's so many good cards in this list. Let's just go through the creatures. We got our dork package here, Esper Sentinel, one of the staples of the format. More mana dorks, and we have Ragavan, which is not only a classic mana dork in the format in, in some senses, but also an advantage engine, and it's a legendary permanent, and therefore it is perfect for this list. It adds power to Sisse, it gets you card advantage, gets you mana advantage. It's more than you could ever ask for this deck. It's perfect. Then we have Skrelv, which is a newer edition and a pretty solid one because it's a one mana legendary permanent that protects your creatures and this is a mostly creature combo deck it's a deck that combos with creatures and sometimes planeswalkers but a lot of the time your creatures are pretty important so having a mother of runes or giver runes type effect on a legendary permanent that also buffs sisse is super solid and Skrelv is awesome <laughs> and the cool part is you do have like a reasonable amount of haste enablers in the deck or ways to get Skrelv ready to go when you play it and that does help get your opponent sometimes Dranth Magistrate, key piece in the deck in the sense that it's just a good card in the format. <laughs> it's not really vital to actually what the deck is doing, but it's Dranth, it's so good, and uh, it really helps to slow what your opponents are doing down. Kinnon's awesome in this deck. The amount of times I have had exactly enough treasures to activate Sisse, and instead of like going through one line, I just get Kinnon out, and then I crack my treasures, and then I have two Sisse activations instead of the one we previously thought I had. Kinnon is really, really good at cleaning up those combos. It's also really good at setting up scenarios where you play your early mana rocks, and then use those early mana rocks to cast Sisse with a Sisse activation up. So despite it not doubling up on potential mana, like a lot of the time you're making two of the same mana, it's not like Kinnon can then like tap a green blue thing and then have it make green and blue right Kinnon will say if you use a birds of paradise to make green mana it will make two green mana that being said Kinnon still ramps you a ton it's a way if you lose sisse to start pulling creatures onto the battlefield which is kind of nice it's not the the key use of the card and definitely not the what you play it for but it's it can be helpful at time to time and then yeah just it doubling up all your mana in a very mana hungry deck is really really helpful lavinia you know it's a classic stacks piece it's a two pip legendary permanent gives sisse another two power seems like kind of not to include here same with lotho lotho's kind of cracked in this deck you know it just gives you treasures to activate sisse slash cast sisse and it gives you two power on sisse it's like one of the coolest cards for the deck it's not great when you're like trying to actually go through combo chains but on as just like as much raw value as you can get for two mana on a legendary permanent it's pretty up there derevi is pretty solid and just a crazy combo piece there is another combo in the deck that we did not cover and that's emil plus derevi plus gaia's cradle if you have four creatures so what happens is um, if you have Derevi out, you have Meal out, you have Guy's Cradles out. Guy's Cradle, if you have four creatures, as I said, so you need basically what you would hope would be Sisse, Emil, Derevi, and one other creature. Tap Cradle for four, use Emil's ability to flicker Derevi, Derevi will come in, untap the Cradle. Now you've generated one green mana, you can go through this loop over and over again, generating infinite green mana, and then you can start using that extra green mana to start filtering into other colors. So we're in a scenario where Derevi is a combo piece in the deck, and then also, you know, Sisse activations are expensive, but what you can do a lot of the time is you can go to combat, hit your 
opponents with some of your things in the air. Sisse, who is once again always going to have more power and like often like six or seven power in combat. So, you know, chunking in with Sisse and your opponents not being able to block effectively happens quite a lot. So, when you start attacking with your mana dorks, with your ragavans, with your Sisse's, with your Derevis, you're often able to actually like in the middle of combat float a bunch of mana and activate Sisse before you even go to your second main phase and still have all of your mana untapped to do shenanigans afterwards. So genuinely Derevi is really really solid in the deck. It's a huge combo piece. It's it's a great piece for just getting your game plan online. Derevi is just awesome. Some people are running Ashiok in their Sisse list instead of Opposition Agent. I just like having a nice clean Opposition Agent that doesn't cost 8 mana. 8 being, you know, 3 to play Sisse, 5 to activate Sisse. I like to do the ability to just do the Opposition Agent thing. I still think the card's super awesome. Just kind of do the thing. <laughs> uh, Range Captain's in here because it's one of the best cards in the format. Like, pretty hands down. It's awesome at slowing your opponents down. It's awesome at protecting your wins. And, you know, we have a decent amount of one drops we can fetch off of it. I had gushed about Zavala earlier. Drawn on Lenvala has been awesome. There are certain pieces in the format that exist that can really, really hose what your deck is trying to do. For example, I played against a Spellskite when I was in MC Minneapolis, and I realized that like zero of my combos actually worked through a Spellskite. So I had to tutor through my library to get a Drawn on Lenvala, which was awesome because it then gave Drawn on Lenvala the ability of Spellskite, as well as taking away my opponent's ability to interfere with my combo. So Drawn on Lenvala has been really really solid for this deck. Sakashima the Imposter is one that I'm playing that I don't think is like the best card in the deck by any means but it's also cute and good. I've been playing Phyrexian Metamorph in most of my blue decks nowadays. Uh, I've been playing Phantasmal Image and a number of others. This one's four mana so it's not as good as those cards as far as efficiency is concerned but it is good in the fact that if you need to tutor a legend onto the battlefield with Sisse you can do that and also it has a lot of flexibility. Sometimes it's just copy your opponent's dock sides which is more than enough. Dockside Distortionist, I know we like vaguely talked about it earlier in the deck deck. It, the card's insane, obviously one of the best cards in CEDH period. In this deck, it just makes your combos so clean. You don't have to worry about tapping creatures, you don't have to worry about mana dorks, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. A Dockside plus a Sisse plus a certain amount of treasures usually just means you're wrapping things up and the game's pretty much over. It's a very solid card and obviously very, very good in this deck. You have your Emil plus Dockside combos, the classic combo there, to just sometimes make infinite mana without even really worrying about the classic Sisse plan, which one thing I really love about this deck, if you notice, if people have been watching the channel a lot lately, I'm talking about Laird win conditions every other day on this channel. I think it's just so good. The ability to, in a hundred card singleton, have consistent access to just trying to win the game and, you know, not completely throwing away into any interaction, not making your combo so easy to be disrupted and also not like completely destroying the card quality of the deck, right? But the fact that a lot of these combos that I've talked about in this list layer over one another really is indicative to the fact that one of the things I like most about this list, you can just combo off super easily and it really, really creates a lot of cool scenarios. One thing you will notice here in the creatures in this five color list is a lack of Thassa's Oracle. This is not a list that I play Thassa's Oracle, Demonic Consultation, or Tainted Pact in, and the reason behind that is literally just because I haven't needed it. I've talked about how all of these win conditions that we've mentioned here in the deck tech so far just layer so nicely with one another, and it's really unnecessary for you to be even playing Thassa's Oracle in a deck like this. It's obviously a super powerful win condition. It's very good in the format. It's commander agnostic, which is awesome, but the amount of redundancy layering and continual card quality of the fact that the deck can be played the way it is right now just means that you don't really need to worry about cards like that and you don't have to lower the card quality of your list by playing it. A lot of these tutors should be relatively explainable. You know, obviously Imp Seal, the Mon Tutor are staples of the format. Neoform, Eldritch Evolution, and Finale are as well. And we've talked about all the important creatures that are in this list. Being able to have access to the creatures you need when you need them is super vital. My interaction suite is a little wonky here just because it's, I try to just basically do the best I can with five colors and interact in the ways that I think were necessary. The newest piece here is the stern scolding that's in the list. I tried this for this weekend because I originally had Orem's chant in the list and I was actually lending out my Orem's chant that day and I was just like, you know what, let me try stern scolding. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I've heard it be really positive. I like the idea of countering dock sides and stuff like that or displacer kittens, Najila's you know, Glittenhorn, Buccaneers, Malcolms, all, all of the above. I said, you know, that seems flexible enough to, you know, jam it, right? So when I looked through that, I was like, okay, Stern's Golding's at least worth testing out for the weekend. I literally only saw it once. And the one time I did see it, it was effective at protecting my win. So I wasn't upset about it by any means, but I don't know that's going to stay in the deck forever. However, the others 
are a lot of staples of this format. The other one that might be worth noting here is the Dismember, which is not a card I've noticed traditionally played in a lot of CDH lists. In a five color list, the ability to tap a red black land, to tap a white green land, a list that, once again, you need all five colors to activate your commander. So the ability to tap any of those lands to have interaction and pay for life in a deck that does not care about ad nauseum, we do not care about our life total in literally any way. We don't even run Sylvan Library. Like, <laughs> this is actually, I think, the only effect in the deck, apart from like a Vamp Tutor, that really cares about your life total. So, this member feels kind of free given that. I think this card is actually like pretty slept on in the format, and I've been really, really happy with it, especially in this deck, but I've been playing it in some other mid range decks as well, and I've been very happy with this member. So, I think uh, I think it was seriously a good call for this list and definitely one I think people just should be playing a little bit more than we do traditionally right now as it is. One of the best parts about Sisse is that it uh, does turn on your Deflecting Swats and Fierce Guardianships in the same way that Najila does, which is really nice. You can play Jewel Lotus, crack it, get your commander on board. Those cards are turned on. You can also have that interaction super early on just by playing a Mana Dork and then playing your commander. So it's very easy to have a, you know, two generic mana and one colored pip commander come down really, really early and then turn on these really powerful effects. And it's definitely one of the best parts of the deck is having access to these very early on in the game. Relic of Legends is another one I want to highlight here in the artifacts. The card is bonkers. Like, it is cracked. <laughs> the ability to just be like, okay, I'm going to play this pretty early on. I'm going to play my commander, which then, it, 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 with a lot of your deck, it just turns into an Earthcraft. So you, like, play your commander, tap it to play another Legend, to play another Legend, to play, like, and it just, it goes crazy. And it's not like you're, like, storming off with Relic of Legends. It just helps the fact that you want to have as much mana as possible to be activating Sisse as many times as possible and playing Sisse and playing more Legendary permanent and relic just allows you to speed up that clock by a really significant amount as well as once again opening up the ability to you know attack with your creatures and then hold them back and activate sisse now this does ring true with something that i have over here in the sideboard which is essica god of the tree it's another card i want to test and i think it's good for the same reasons while it doesn't have a hasty effect like relic of legends does this is you know a three mana mana dork that adds one of any color and gives other legendaries you control vigilance and add one of any color so once again you're turning all your legendary permanents which you're playing anyways into mana dorks and also giving them vigilance which means you can actually beat in for combat and then tap them for mana as i mentioned it's in the considering slash sideboard right now it's not one that i have in the current list but i think it is worth talking about and i think maybe putting a little time to test this card could be pretty worthwhile in the enchantments here, we have our Oath of Fairy, like we talked about before. We have Deafening Silence, because this deck does not really care about casting multiple non-creature spells. It is a Planeswalker combo deck at some points, but I think a lot of the times you can just turn casting spells. I mean, casting spells isn't really that important in Sisse in general, right? Because a lot of what you're trying to do is get your hand down and then just start activating Sisse. So Deafening Silence, not stopping your creature combos, barely affecting your other combos. I think the card's just super solid. We have our classic Remora and Rhystic Study here. And then we're, I'm trying out Flowering of the White Tree. It seems really good. The fact that it adds three power to Sisse because it itself is a white permanent, therefore adding one power, the legendary white permanent. Then also giving legendary creatures you control plus two plus one and ward one. And uh, I don't know if you noticed from the rest of the deck deck, there's a lot of legendary creatures in this deck. And the non-legendaries you control get another plus one plus one in general. So it does a lot of work for this list. I think the card is actually pretty solid and I think it will help to accelerate the curve of what Sisse is trying to do. And it will help to give you activation to start getting larger and larger creatures out of your deck pretty early. And I kind of like it more than Cultist because this one has a much higher upside if things aren't going your way. Whereas Cultist the Absolute is amazing when you can activate Sisse and like get two cards and win the game, right? This card is just much better at the floor. Like the floor of this card is you make Sisse a, uh, I want to say, 6-5 with Ward 1, and that's the minimum thing that this card does in the deck. So flowering is really cool, and I'm interested to see if I continue playing it. Down here in the lands, we have Beseju and Odawara, which is a little sketchy for a five-color deck, I'll admit. I was on 30 lands to sort of make up for that at one point, but I played it this deck all this weekend and didn't really have any mana troubles, which is a really nice thing. But we're also playing a decent amount of mana rocks, playing a decent amount of mana dorks. Something to think about. On Cradle here, obviously, we mentioned it's a combo piece earlier in the deck deck, and also 
just, you know, really good card. A highlight from this weekend was actually activating this card in its last ability, which is not why you play it in the deck. This is Mount Doom, and one of the best Lord of the Rings cards for this deck, absolutely. The fact that, so it's a, it's a red-black land that you can pay one life to add red or black. I did cut bad lands for this just because we're really running out of space in the deck, and also red-black is, like, not really our primary colors by any means. And then its middle ability is why it's in the deck, because you can pay one red black to deal one damage to each opponent. Which means if you are doing infinite flicker stuff in your deck and you have infinite mana, you're pulling things out of your list. Traditionally you used to have to bring a card like Kroxa out of your deck and then stack a bunch of triggers and that's what will kill your opponents. But now we have Mount Doom, which you can put in the land base and therefore opens up a slot in the 99 of your deck. It opens up a slot for a non-land in the, your deck which is super, super cool. And uh, yeah, it just basically means that if you can keep flickering Mount Doom and activating the ability, you can ping your opponents to death with a land, and it's a legendary land, which means Sisei can tutor it right to the battlefield. So it's pretty solid for that. The only other strange one here is Plaza of Heroes, but as we talked about, so many legends in this deck kind of makes sense for a legendary land that is focused on legends to be super important to this deck. One thing I want to point out before we move on to mulligans is, if you notice, we have a decent amount of mana dorks in this list, things that tap to make mana as creatures, but we also do have a decent amount of mana rocks, artifacts that tap to make mana as well. I think it's really important in a lot of these mid-range creature combo decks to diversify the mana base, to not just rely completely on creatures mana and not completely rely on artifact mana and I think I've noticed that a lot of the decks that have been more successful in the format have a diversity of both so that they're sort of protected against curse totem effects and they're sort of protected against collector roof style effects and they don't really get hated out by either one being targeted. Without any further ado let's do a little bit of play testing but before we do I want to remind you guys that we have Lotus Con coming up in Belleville Illinois October 7th and 8th we are ambassadors here on Comedian MTG of Monarch Media. They have gone with Mythic Lotus gaming and they are making lotus con this year which has a crazy enough a prize structure which i can actually get the tweet over here on twitter and i'll throw that in the description down below but we have thousands of dollars in prizes the first place player gets a time twister this is going to be a crazy event october 7th through 8th i'm so excited for it and you know for a fact i will be there not only that but i just found out my tattoo artist who i used to go to in massachusetts before i moved who did not only my kiki jiki but my dust skull and my mimikyu will actually be attending this event doing tattoos for magic players as well as two other tattoo artists at the event which i think is super cool so all of that will be at mythic lotus gaming lotus con belleville illinois please come check it out i will be there i will be jamming cedh you know i'm gonna be trying to get a time twister because i do not own one but i would like to very badly all right without any further ado let's get into those mulligans all right so this hand here it's a bit of an interesting one for first seven and it's one that you know sort of begs the question uh oh also so whenever I do mulligans, I like to go over here to the player tab. I like to go all the way down here to roll a four-sided die. Boom. Okay, so I say we're going third. This is a weird hand. The problem with it is that I'm normally actually pretty inclined to keep a hand that's turn one Esper Sentinel, but this can't even cast the Esper Sentinel, which means we're not doing anything until turn two where we can cast Wish Claw. And I don't really think Wish Claw Pass as our first action of the game is really worth ever keeping. So I'm going to go to a second seven here. Here we have a very interesting gemstone caverns hand. Once again, we're going in third. The biggest problem I see with this hand here is that we can get, you know, some two lands down the first turn and then like what, we're casting a wish claw talisman and passing? It's better than doing little nothing, but Neoform's kind of a dead card here until we can draw a creature. We can play Sisse turn two and not really once again do anything. We have no way to generate more mana. We can maybe tutor for a dockside if we think it's gonna be the world's greediest dockside pod, but I think that's a, a bit of a bit of a copium so we're gonna go to a six here I mean okay so this hands cracked <laughs> what do we put on the bottom honestly probably a land because this we don't need any more mana sources for sure so yeah uh, you know draw for carve turn oh my god this hands crazy you play once again one third so fell war stone is definitely gonna be online uh play all these play this and play this yeah i mean sometimes hands are stupid like that is just that is a dumb powerful hand and you know obviously we want to dump our mana down Although I don't think we're learning a lot from a hand like that. So let's go to another first seven. And we're going to reroll player order. Boom. We're going first. Nice. 
So we have one land here, uh, some sacrifice creature effects, nothing to do with them. Finale, which needs more mana. Cyclonic, doing nothing. This hand's garbage. We're going to mulligan that right away. Uh, we have a no lander here, so instantly going to six cards. Bit of an awkward hand here. We only have one land and a mox diamond, which means that we have a single mana source. We have Oko. We have Force of Will, which is nice. It's free, right? Uh, Cyclonic Rift, two mana interaction, two mana interaction with only one land, and a worldly tutor, which means we don't even get to draw for a land because the worldly tutor replaces our dry step. We got to go to five here. Uh, another no lander. You know, sometimes you just get unlucky. Let's go to four. Woof. Okay. This is, you know, let's get this bad luck out of the way. Honestly, this four is so mid that I kind of want to even go to a three. Just because, like, what game are you winning with one land and Arcane Signet and, like, a Draineth Magistrate? I, I don't think that's really anything, right? Or even just, like, keeping a Force of Will so you can two for one yourself on an already low hand. I'd say we go to three and see what happens. Okay, cool. So, honestly, at a three, I'm just sort of inclined to just go, like, one two, three here, right? So you don't do anything turn one, play a land turn two, go tutor for a Dockside and hope that your deck gets the ability to do something broken with your opponents having a lot of stuff. And then say you're in a pod where a Dockside is bad for some reason, which is unlikely, but you know, they, they exist. You can always tutor for something like a Bloom Tender, see what your draws are for the next couple turns. I think that's doable. Also Lotho is a real card too, so. All right, for seven, so close. We have Finale and Ikoria, which are great. But uh, you don't do anything turn one, and as much as Bloom Tender is an awesome piece in the deck, I don't want to just do nothing turn one, play Bloom Tender turn two, no interaction, pass. Seems kind of slow. Second seven. Okay, we have two lands here, a Lotus Petal, a Vamp Tutor, which is pretty interesting, and a Derevi. This is a weird one. I kind of like, despite what I literally just said in the last one, uh, because of the presence of Derevi, I kind of like Vamp Tutoring for either a Faber Elder or a Bloom Tender here, which is beyond ironic. And then turn two, playing it with the ability to have Swords and Misstep Backup, which is sort of the difference here for me in this hand. Uh, and then you can next turn after that, use the Bloom Tender to play the Derevi, which then untaps the Bloom Tender, which makes a bunch of mana, which allows you to play Sisse, and then, you know, the turn after that, you're probably just starting to activate Sisse and probably winning the game from that point, because, uh, let's, let's just play that out, actually, uh, because that's the whole point of doing something like this. So, say this is our turn one. I want to keep this hand for the reasons that I just talked about, okay? We're going to draw a card turn. It's a swan song, sure. I don't mind more interaction. So we're going to play a card like Scalding Tarn, and I think we're going to go crack that. And if you remember earlier in this video, I mentioned that we do not play Badlands because we're playing Mount Doom. So I'm going to go grab an Underground Sea, even though we already have a blue land here in our opening hand. I do realize the irony of the fact that we cannot cast a Bloom Tender off of this, but we're kind of working with what we got here. So on our first turn, we're going to play that Lotus Petal, get that Underground Sea, and we're going to Vamp Tutor. Lose two more life. Go put a Bloom Tender on top of our library. Boom, it's on top. Next turn, untap. Gonna play this land here, and now we're gonna wanna hold up both our Swan Song and our Swords to Plowshares, right? So we're gonna go, boom, play this Bloom Tender. It's turn two. And once again, it's not just Bloom Tender passed, it's Bloom Tender with three separate pieces of interaction, which is significantly better. And then we're gonna untap the turn after that. Great. So something we can do here is we can go green, blue, white, play Derevi, untap the Bloom Tender here, and suddenly, oh, now Bloom Tender is making three mana, which is, again, a lot better than what it was doing before. Uh, and then we can use that to cast Sisse, or if you're really nervous, your opponents are doing some crazy stuff, maybe you can just hold up Swan Song, Metal Misstep, and Source Splash Shares again. But the hope is that you can be in a scenario where you can jam this Sisse here. The turn after that are where things get interesting. You kind of pray that you get a, a fetch land or some sort of mana source here because uh, the one thing you're missing is red mana. Um, so this is awesome here because you can go crack this Marsh Flats, you go get your Plateau. And then I don't know what happened to Derevi. <laughs> All right, so right here on the board, we have one, two, three, four, five. That is a Sisse activation. Not only do we have a Sisse activation on the board, but remember when I was talking about earlier in the deck tech, how Derevi can go to combat and start swinging in, and then suddenly you're going, oh, wait a minute, this is you know, something that can untap Bloom Tender twice, but you also need to respect the fact that you need red mana here with this. So yeah, you can use the cards that you have in the battlefield to activate Sisse at least twice this turn, which is pretty sweet. And the first activation can get you a piece that will be able to activate the second time. So for example, if we have this scenario here, right? Let's say these are the cards we are using. I'm gonna go to combat and I'm gonna attack with Derevi and Sisse. Most likely Sisse can get in because it has five power at this point 
with Derevi's three pips. And we'll put Derevi trigger so that they're targeting this Bloom Tender and this red source here. So we go one, two, three, four, five. Activate Sisse, and this is in response to the triggers that we talked about. Now, one thing with this deck is that this is a puzzle deck. I like to call Sisse a puzzle deck because it is always like you're solving a very complicated puzzle. And that's one of the best parts about the deck as well. And also one of the challenges with this deck. It is very difficult to pilot at 100% correctness, but it also is very, very strong. And the ability to sort of just pop off with a lot of the cards in here at any time because of how flexible these pieces are. For example, the cards we have right now, if I go get let's say what's a good one here um so Sisse can get anything with cmc4 or less because it will now have five power the easiest one to guarantee a silly amount of mana with would probably be sahili okay so let's get sahili on the board actually we can't do sahili my bad so let's get dihada instead and this is one of the the situations where having dihada is really good and i'll explain the difference of why i said that so we have dihada on the battlefield right now okay now the drevi triggers can resolve we're untapping our bloom tender and we're untapping this the plateau here uh we're going to first of all if you noticed uh Sisse is now at maximum capacity because i have red white black blue green so it has all legendary permanent mana colors so Sisse is a seven seven can get any of the permanents in our deck that are relevant so bloom tender also taps for five mana now this is where things start to get nutty. Uh, so you just activate Bloom Tender once to activate Sisse. Okay, sure. What's a good card to get here? Uh, we mentioned earlier that we can go get Aminatu um, in this circumstance. Now, as studious observers will notice that we actually have the ability to go grab Emil here and just Emil Derevi Bloom Tender combo. That's one of the ways we can win right now. But we can also do something like grab Aminatu. We can also use the Aminatu's minus to untap the Derevi which will then enter the battle, or I guess flicker Derevi, which will then untap the Bloom Tender. Oh, hey, look, we have another Sisse activation. Boop, go through the combo. Go get Emil. Sorry, activate again. Go get Nicol Bolas. Oh, hey, Nicol Bolas has Aminatu's ability. So Nicol Bolas is going to minus, reset Aminatu. Aminatu is going to flicker the Derevi to flicker the Bloom Tender. Oh, hey, we're going to activate again. We will get our Oath of Teferi. Now these can infinitely flicker each other and then flicker the Derevi to untap the Bloom Tender to generate infinite mana of every color and start activating Sisse and pull a bunch of cards out. Easiest one to do, as we mentioned earlier, is going to be Mount Doom, which is a zero mana legendary permanent. And then we can, once again, infinite mana, activate Mount Doom. Then we can flicker Derevi to untap Mount Doom, activate Mount Doom, flicker Derevi, untap Mount Doom. That's a win condition right there. So I just wanted to do one or two examples of how we would actually use the combos in these decks to keep pulling cards out and actually turn what it looks like originally, once again, just to say Derevi Bloom Tender into actually straight up winning the game this turn. And if you noticed here, um, before I started pulling a bunch of cards out of my library, uh, I had Plateau and Tundra untapped with a Dihada activation. So I could have actually minus Dihada here to make four treasures or, you know, or four or less treasures, but also put some legendary permits in my hand to have a second Sisse activation as backup. I just didn't do that because it was, this was trying to explain this as quickly as possible. The same thing could be said about grabbing Emil early on when we saw that Emil, Bloom Tender, and Drevi were basically creating a combo. Solid options here. Let's do another hand. This is an awkward no lander, one of the tough parts about playing these single color lands in the deck. Awkward hand, and we'll have to ship it, which is awkward because if this was a green source, I would actually be pretty tempted to keep it. Also, let's roll for player order just to make sure we're going second, great. All right, second seven. Another one lander here, rather unfortunate. At one point, once again, there were 30 lands in this deck, and hands like this make me not sure about whether <laughs> going down to 29 was the right move, but we're gonna we're gonna ship it again. Okay, this is our six, and it's so slow. Uh, we can't really do anything for the first couple turns except for hold up instant speed interaction. We're gonna go to five. Yeah, okay, this is where the money is. All right, this hand's pretty solid. I think it's pretty safe to say Sakashima, despite being a good card, is also very slow. And Oath of Deferi is very slow as well. And a card, once again, we really don't need it in our hand, but we want it for those tutor chains. So let's put that back in our deck. In the hand like this, I would draw. Oh, Nickel Bolas is not the great draw there, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, play this Noble Hierarch. Now, th there's also an option to play this Arid Mesa. I am not doing that specifically because I need this green mana turn one, and I want to have Arid Mesa be able to fetch me different colors than the colors that we're seeing here. So the idea that Arid Mesa could go get me a red land or a white black land uh, to be able to add to the color palette that we are not seeing here for activating Sisse is pretty important. I think it probably goes gets a Marsh Lats to turn after this one. 
So let's go to turn two. I get probably a marsh flats here. And I think the most, well, this hand is a little low on interaction. Sometimes this happens with hands. Oh, did I say marsh flats? <laughs> I'm in a scrubland. As I was saying, a hand like this can be a little low on interaction, but it's pretty important to be able to get your own engine online. So despite, once again, not being as quick as we might want a hand like this to be, it's we got to kind of do things in the order we have. So turn two here, we can get this Fabra Alder down, and then next turn, we're going to start making like silly amounts of mana. The tough part about this hand is that we don't currently have a red source, which is a little unfortunate uh, for situations like this, where you'd want to go green, white, blue, Cast a Revy, untap this Favor Elder. Now, Favor Elder makes green, white, and blue. It's awesome, we can go get our Sisse and basically play Sisse, hold up Odawara, and hope that we start drawing a red source at some point. Yeah, it's gonna be a little bit, but uh, in hands like this, it can be a little awkward when you don't have your fifth color, and you know, sometimes playing a land like Gemstone Caverns is amazing in some hands and not so amazing in others. But that's kind of the play pattern we're trying to go for here. Obviously, we got a little stumbled on lands there, and our interaction came a little bit later than I think we would like optimally. But as you can see, even though we mold to five, we still have a game plan going pretty early on with some interaction we can hold up. Odawar being uncounterable interaction too is pretty good. We'll get our commander down, start beating in, making a bunch of mana. Not, once again, necessarily able to use that mana as optimally as we would like, but still better than nothing. Also, a cute interaction to know here with Noble and Ignoble Hierarch to notice they uh, have Exalted, which means you can actually attack with Sisse alone and increase Sisse's power, which will allow you to skip one level of the Tudor Chains. Because despite its power being increased by Legendary Permanents, it actually only checks Sisse's power. It doesn't check how many Legendary Permanents they are when you activate Sisse's ability, which is why cards like Cultist the Absolute are very strong. Let's get one more playable hand and hopefully we can go through some lines with it. Uh, this is a first seven here and we are going first. Okay, cool. Uh, unfortunately, Mox Amber isn't turned on until we get Sisse out and we can't seem to do that early. Neoform has no targets. Ristic Study, despite being busted, is not a card we can get down according to this hand yet. So unfortunately, this hand's a little clunky and slow, so we're gonna have to ship it. Uh, we have a turn one Sisse here with literally no mana. Uh, one land in this hand would have been gas. Sadly, we're gonna throw this bad boy away. Six, all right. Once again, we are going first on a six here. This hand seems more than acceptable. A little bit of awkwardness here with Fabro Elder because we have to use this to go get a source that makes green, but we want to be able to play Fabro Elder. So I guess we're going to have to just sort of hope in landing this Odawar here for a Ristic Study on turn two. So let's play this hand out. I like it. Scalding Tarn here. Uh, we already have a blue source, so I'm going to say let's go crack this Scalding Tarn here for a Taiga because we need that green on turn one to be able to play this ignoble hierarch. While we are here doing these mulligans, I just wanna remind everybody that I do offer CEDH coaching and a lot of the coaching that I do with people is going through mulligans like this. The ability to you know be able to quickly analyze a hand like this and say, I know I wanna go for these play patterns and things like that is I find the thing that most people struggle with and especially in CEDH in a deck like this also where your tutor chains are requiring a lot of thought. They require you to feel pretty precisely about what lines you want to be going for. Uh, and because of that, it can be difficult. And if you have questions about tutoring in decks like this, stuff like that, you can reach out to me at comedianmtg at gmail.com. You can reach me on Twitter or Discord, any of the places where you can send me a direct message. I'm happy to get messages about that. There are also Patreon tiers that are for coaching specifically, but you can always reach out to me outside of those Patreon tiers. Okay, so we have this turn one ignoble here, and then let's go to turn two. Uh, we haven't drawn another land, which is a little bit awkward, but hopefully we are relying a bit on a risk study here. I don't like to display hands that rely on Ristic Study for these examples because we don't know how bad the Ristic Study will be felt. We can assume Ristic Study will be fed pretty well because we are turn two on the play, uh, but we can't guarantee anything. So for teaching purposes, I think we have to find another hand here just because Ristic Study cannot exemplify what the deck's trying to do. So first seven and we are going third. Okay. Uh, I'm super happy with a first seven like this. We have a turn one soul ring into a Felwar stone plus our land. We have enough lands to continue ramping us in our deck. We can start to get a cord of calling down as early as turn two and cord X equals two to go get a dockside is almost always pretty busted in this deck. So I'm feeling pretty good about this one. We're gonna keep, let's draw a card. All right, we have a tropical island for a soul ring and then a Felwar stone. 
Next turn, we're gonna untap. We're gonna <laughs> play a land. Uh, and then, you know, awkwardly, I just talked about how the last hand was awesome, but unusable for this content. And I think this is sort of the same thing here, right? We can get a Sisse down this turn. We can get a Ristic Study down this turn, or we can hold up Court of Calling X equals two. All of these things are super doable and super usable and very, very solid, kind of what you want to be doing with the deck. But the problem is uh, just doing a test hand here. We don't know how much Dockside is going to make. We don't know how much people are going to feed a Rhystic Study, and we don't know the scenarios in which you want to play your Sisse instead. So for that, we're just going to say that was a very keepable seven, and let's look at a new one. Mm, we have an awkward one here. Let's once again roll for turn order. We are going last. So this is a one lander that has a Mox Diamond, which is basically a dead card unless we top deck a card for turn. We have an Ignoble Hierarch. And once again, if we can guarantee that this was another land here, I think this would be a very different hand. But as of right now, we only have two guaranteed mana. Uh, Draneth is not able to be cast with this hand. Invasion equals zero, doesn't get a single card out of our deck. And as much as I would love to guarantee that we can get these two cards down next turn, we have to guarantee the land drop in those first two draws. And I'm the kind of player who takes that kind of gamble, especially going forth. So let's go to our second seven. Second seven here is looking pretty cute. I actually like this one a decent amount. It's a little strangely paced, but I think it has a lot of potential. We got to treat this Chromox here while we would normally love to treat it like, you know, a, a piece of fast mana. It's kind of more like a mana dork that you have to discard a card for. I still think it's keepable because turn two, Favro Elder into a Sisse, uh, plus some flexible mana here in the mana base, I think leads to some pretty solid stuff. So let's draw for our turn. Okay, we have Invasion of Ikoria. That's not, I'm not gonna lie, not the best draw here in this circumstance. I kind of want this Marsh Flats to get a black source at some point or a green source uh, to be able to hold up stuff. So maybe this goes and gets a Bayou, which means that this Invasion might get exiled later on. But right now we don't need to jam the Chromox yet before we know what kind of cards we're looking out for. So I'm okay with just passing turn one with a Fluster Storm up. I know that's not always traditional play patterns. People don't usually like go crazy for hands like this. And this might be too slow going forth. It's definitely worth arguing that this might not be enough, but I think we have a game plan here and it might be worth exploring. So let's draw a card for turn. We have Sahili Rai, which actually helps a lot as far as casting our spells. As I mentioned, we're gonna go get a Bayou with this Marsh Flats and then Let's Chromox our Sahili Rai away. And then we can go play our favorite Elder for the turn. Next turn, we can untap. We will have the ability to cast Drana and Linvala. If we need to cast that card, we can cast Sisse. We have our Fierce Guardianship back up. We have an Imperial Seal. And we have Invasion of Ikoria to be able to do stuff. As I mentioned, though, this is turn three. For some people, this hand might be too slow. So I say let's go a little greedy and say what happens if we go to a second seven. Second seven here. Also pretty gas, looks like I was directly punished for keeping such a safe hand on my last hand. Let's go, and we're gonna draw. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. Turn one, I'm just gonna jam this Noble Hierarch. Uh, there is some sort of argument to playing the Chromox's turn, but you're not casting anything with a Chromox, and I don't really get, I mean, so the other argument is to play a Chromox, exile one of these cards, and play a Deathrite Shaman this turn. <sighs> it's, I think it's a very solid argument either way. I think with the way this hand looks, uh, it's tough, uh, it's tough. So maybe let's let's go greedy here. Let's say we're going a little bit greedy with this hand. And then in that circumstance, I actually think you exile the invasion because Fabro plus Derevi is already a really solid combo. So let's go do that, play a Death Rite Shaman. Another scenario in which you might not go for this play pattern is if you think the Death Rite Shaman is not going to be able to exile lands out of graveyards. If you're against a bunch of opponents who aren't playing decks with fetches, it's something that happens at times. And Death Rite Shaman has uh, annoyingly done nothing thing too many times for me to feel always confident about this card. Then we're gonna go to the next turn, be able to play our land for turn here. Uh, something we can do is that I like imagining death rate is on. We can go here, one, two, three mana. We can play our Relic of Legends, which is pretty solid, and then use the Relic of Legends to be able to, on turn two here, as these permanents want to tap, play this Fabro Elder. Now turn three is where things start to get silly. We can play our land as our turn here, probably go get a red source, probably the Taiga from our deck. We can use these uh, permanents here to uh, play Derevi. I'm gonna take that one back. 
We're gonna tap Fabra Elder here for Abzan mana, and then we can use that blue to play Derevi. Uh, so we have a black mana floating, we can untap our Fabra Elder, it's like we literally didn't even cast anything. <laughs> we can then tap two here with this Chromox and this to play our Sisse, and now we have a lot of mana available. So the Derevi, as we remember, uh, it just came in, right? So it can't attack or anything like that. But now this Fabra Elder, uh, it can tap for four mana, and Relic of Legends means Derevi can tap for mana, and Sisse can tap for mana. So we can start doing some really dumb things here. This combo absolutely wins you the game here on turn three, but let's walk you through it. So we already have a black mana floating in this pool. Let's go and activate Sisse by activating and making every color but red. Uh, and then we can tap to Revy for a red mana. We're gonna activate our Sisse and we can get anything with mana value four or less because we have Derevi here. So the easiest one, I think, is one that we've talked about a little bit already, which is Sahili Rai. And the reason why I'm prioritizing Sahili Rai specifically is because of that red mana value, the red pip here up in its casting costs. Because now when I make an untapped Fabro Elder, that is going to be able to make all five colors. This is where the deck starts doing the silly stuff. Uh, so let's go, boom, loyalty counter gone, boom, loyalty counter gone. Oop. We're going to make a hasty copy of Fabro Elder from Sahili's ability. We're gonna tap that for five mana. We're gonna activate Sisse again. Okay, so now Sisse is at six loyalty. Uh, we are going to be able to, I think the cleanest way to go from here would be go get Aminatu. We're gonna have Aminatu come in, it'll flicker Sahili, Sahili will come in, make another Fabro Elder, Fabro Elder will tap again. We'll be able to go get our Nicol Bolas. I think you guys can see where this is going. Get our Nicol Bolas. Oh, hey, Nicol Bolas is here. We're gonna flicker our Sahili, which is gonna make another Fabro Elder. Oh, well, that's weird. That's gonna go get our Oath of Teferi. And then we are going to win the game. Once again, this line, super clean, right? You start to get a dork that can tap for five. You start to get something that can make a hasty Dockside or a hasty Mana Dork. And suddenly, turn three, we put all of this onto the battlefield. So, <laughs> yes, the hand we kept was a little bit greedy. You kind of rely on Deathrite Shaman a little bit for that turn two. On the other hand, uh, we just won the game on turn three. With, I want to point out, not many cards that are frequently countered. On turn three, we just played Derevi and our commander. So that's a creature combo. And uh, despite this deck playing a decent amount of Planeswalkers, it is a creature combo deck. And as many people know about CEDH, creature combo decks are extremely hard to interact with. And that is one of the best parts about this list. If you need to take this deck slower, sometimes you can, instead of just going for it turn three, which as we can see, very clearly worked here, you can also wait to hold up your Teferi Time Raveler activation, go pull that out of your deck and instead the next turn turn four just go for a protected win that also can just pop off super quickly and also with your ability to have your opponents only be able to interact with Odoar and besage you so the deck starts to do some very very silly stuff and it's been really really fun to play and really strong and that's five color Sisse legend chain. I know some of these lines can be a little bit complicated and I know it's a little bit tough to parse through these things, but that's the fun part about this deck. It is literally a moving puzzle. It is like opening up your phone and opening up a new Sudoku every single day or a new word puzzle, right? It is going through and as you're playing this game, as you're navigating a game of CEDH, you're also trying to put the pieces together to be able to assemble this working machine that says, hey, I'm gonna make Dockside go from activating my commander once to actually just winning the entire game i'm going to turn this bloom tender into a win condition you know with things like that i'm going to turn these planeswalkers which are traditionally not even edh cards not to mention cedh cards and i'm going to turn them into game winning pieces so i adore this deck genuinely it's super awesome i've been in scenarios literally i played a game this weekend where someone removed a stacks piece and i was able to win before the passing of a phase it does crazy stuff like that the deck is super fun it's super hard for your opponents to figure out just because of the fact that you know there's so many different moving pieces and it can be super easy for you to really get to flex some knowledge to be able to come up with some super interesting lines to be able to play cards that not many people get to play it's been super fun to play i truly just adore playing this list and i hope y'all enjoyed this deck tech today thank you for watching everybody i hope you enjoyed this video make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and to check out patreon.com slash mtg where every piece of help helps to make this channel go and grow this is becoming my full-time job doing this channel and doing coaching 
coaching for CEDH. So if you are interested in CEDH coaching, free to DM me on any of the places we talked about earlier, email, Twitter, and Discord. Or if you're interested in Patreon, go over to patreon.com slash comedian MTG and check out all of the benefits we have, like amazing people who get their name in the show notes right here. I, I, I can feel the blood creeping up from the heathens. Got will, got fight, got pride, got reason. If they want to go eat, then you know I'm going to feed them. If you're coming for me, hope you're ready for a demon. I got eyes in the back of my head I'm seeing. Take me for granted and you know I'm leaving. I'm going to take what's mine with the webs I'm weaving. I could take this crap from seeing to believing.